William Bonville. Excuse me, it's Von Villian. Von Villian. Von Villian. Okay, so here we go. William Von Villian, you are a lecturer at MIT. Before that, you served for 17 years as a legislative director in science and technology. You have co authored five books on technology and the workforce. In recent years, you have worked on workforce education issues, and you just co-wrote a book called Workforce Education, A New Roadmap. William, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So this is a hot topic, uh, William. Uh, our workforce is changing by the minute. Every time there is a new app, a new technology development, it seems like it's shifting the whole uh, workplace environment and people and now the virus as well is just transform everything i think it accelerated tendencies that were already underway a few uh, as far as last year but it's been like this epidemic have accelerated uh, this shift almost uh, fast track it almost 20 years from my perspective so um, before we get into that, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background. Let's say you were a 17 year old kid and you are contemplating what to do with your life. How that 17 year old managed to be to where you are today? Well, needless to say, it's a complicated story and the 17 year old had no idea where he was going. Um, but, uh, and I've had about five different careers, Alain. Uh, but, uh, you know, I went off to college and uh, then, you know, I became really interested in philosophy and theology. So I studied religion for a couple of years and got a master's in that. But then, you know, reality caught up. I figured I'd better earn a living. So I went to law school. And, you know, then um, I had been really interested in, you know, government and policy and kind of getting things done. And I kind of came out of the civil rights movement a bit. You know, I spent time as a kid and hanging out in those, those circles. So I went into, uh, went into government and, you know, ended up in, of all places, the Department of Transportation. And I worked there for four years, came back to law practice. Um, I was fine, but wanted to, wanted to get back to policymaking again. So a friend of mine got elected to the, somebody I knew pretty well, got elected to the U.S. Senate. And you know, I had one of those Washington conversations where he said, you know, why don't you come up and we'll talk? And... I thought, you know, maybe I'll do that for a year, you know, see what that's like. And I, um, I ended up spending 17 years working in the U.S. Senate, got to work on what I thought was a lot of important stuff, and developed a real interest in science and tech policy. Um, how does innovation work? How does technology advance occur? Um, so I kind of had a specialty working on those in those areas and was involved in most of the legislation in the Senate in, the night time, in that time period. Uh, that worked in, the, in that territory, did a lot of work with the R&D agencies, and then decided I, I wanted to kind of do that full time. So a job opened up in MIT to run their Washington office, and that office really engages with the federal R&D agencies, a, you know, a system I'd gotten to know when I was working on the Hill. Um, and that was, you know, also working with Congress to some extent. And you know, that was a great job, but MIT was embarked on a whole set of policy questions that really I was fascinated with. So I began writing books and teaching at MIT as well, and did a book on energy technology policy, then a book on, you know, why don't we innovate in kind of what we could call legacy sectors. That was was a lesson from energy. Energy is a legacy sector. How come we can't innovate that fast in energy? How come it's not like IT? So I did that book. And then, then uh, I did a lot of work on advanced manufacturing and the disruption that had occurred in, in the manufacturing sector. And we lost one third of manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2010. So that was an emphasis area at MIT. And I ended up doing a book out of that work uh, on advanced manufacturing. And, and this latest book comes right out of that, right? How are we gonna to get to advanced manufacturing, which we need for quality jobs in the US? Uh, we're only gonna get there if the workforce is ready for it. So that's kind of a shorthand story of my checkered career, Elaine, but. Let me ask you, when you work in policy making, do you feel like, and a sculpture, 
uh, kind of defining the future, whatever contribution you make, uh, no, no matter how much it is, you are helping by creating new laws and policies to, to um, mold the future. Does that give you that sense of a little bit of like a superhero or a superpower? <laughs> Well, not a superhero is superpower, and change is very hard and takes a long time. Um, but, you know, writing these books kind of forced me to understand these new territories, to kind of get a sense for what was happening and, and be able to kind of really think through in depth what the problems were, and then try and make a contribution that way. And then in addition, kind of actively involved in policies that work on implementing some of those ideas. Uh, so I've tried to kind of do both things, kind of understand and try to bring ideas to the to the debate. Okay, and you you speak about the United States or North America losing manufacturing jobs, good paying manufacturing jobs, but at the same time there is this surge of uh, service jobs that they were not even uh, in existence ten years ago, and the United States and North America. They are, from my point of view, uh, leaders in this field. Uh, so isn't it like, yes, uh, an even balance at the end of the day, we lose some and we gain some? It's not an even balance. Okay, I'll tell you why, Elaine. So if, and if you look, at, if you look at, at what's been going on in the last 15 years in the United States, it's, it's like a barbell, you know, weightlifting, it's like a barbell. And a lot of those new IT jobs, they've gone straight to the upper middle class. They've gone to the people with the education and the skill sets that can get them. So that upper middle class, that one, one of the bells on that barbell, and, and an economist named David Otter at MIT has written about that, that upper middle class is better off than they've ever been. They're thriving. And then you got a shrinking middle class. That bar is sitting out and too many people on that bar have gotten shunted into kind of lower end services jobs which is also an expanding sector. So this is a story of growing inequality in the United States, right? Growing wage inequality, income inequality, and social inequality. And it's a story of a working class that's kind of getting pushed aside. And that working class, we think of working class, we think white working class, but it's much broader than that. A huge part of the black community, the Hispanic communities have been hit by the same phenomena and their route into the middle class through areas like manufacturing, that got pushed aside. So that, those communities that make up our working class have been very hard hit. So that's kind of motivated my work on workforce education. Those folks are not going to come back and get, you know, four-year college educations in ivy-clad hallways, right? That's not going to happen. Could we build a workforce education that really served that community? Right. right, that enabled them to get ahead, not just the upper middle class that gets to college. Right. And when we think about this middle class, uh, I, I'm not a historian, but my perception is, is that this middle class that I hear people mention so often is like a new idea that came to fruition after World War II. Because, because uh, before that, the whole US economy was dependent on agriculture. I think over 80% of the economy, uh, if we look at the Dow Jones, almost all the companies were commodity related. And I, once again, I'm not a historian, but I get the idea that all these middle, middle class jobs uh, they came into existence when the soldiers came back from the war and then there was this machinery already in place and that's when it started booming. So I see it as a short-term uh, paragraph in the history of the United States. Am I wrong or how off am I? You're not far from wrong. The timetables of land was longer, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the U.S. was about 40% agriculture in 1900. And then we went through a huge shift, right? And we're now less than 2%, you know, farmers, right, in agriculture. And we're producing more than we ever made in 1900, right? So that's an amazing story of productivity advance. Um, and we, you know, we began industrializing and the United States was the world's leading industrial power by the turn of the century in, in 1900. We were, we were kings. And by the time World War II came along, we had, you know, against our big opponents, right? We had 
four times the production capacity of Germany and eight times the production capacity of Japan. So we had built by the beginning of World War II, despite the depression, a massive industrial powerhouse. And that was key to creation of this middle class that you're talking about. We had a tremendous number of industrial jobs and a lot of spin-off jobs from those. And that was a powerhouse of job creation and of economic well-being, because those were good paying jobs. And you know, the, the story in World War II is an important story because a lot of folks, you know, we had 16 million service people coming home from all over the world. And there was a tremendous worry because we were shutting down the defense economy. You know, we weren't spending money on the wartime. What are we going to do with these people? So we passed the GI Bill. So you're right, absolutely right on about that timing. And that enabled big number of, of those 16 million folks to get quite good educations, many to college, many to other kinds of education. They got ahead, and that put a very strong foundation into a really big period of middle class growth. Um, and then we let that manufacturing sector decline. We lost essentially in competition to mostly Asian countries, particularly China in recent years. And a lot of those jobs went by the wayside. And look, the new technologies, the new IT technologies, they're great, but they're not that big job creators, not like manufacturing. So can we get some manufacturing back, for example? And now, look, now we've got a crisis in big services sectors because of COVID. Retail, right? That was face-to-face -face retail was being really hard hit before coronavirus. That decline has really accelerated. There's, there's 15 or more million people in that sector. They're going to be hard hit after we get through this virus. You know, so too with other sectors like hospitality. Uh, and travel, right? Those are gonna be hard hit sectors. So we've got a problem that's bigger than the one we had in World War II, what to do with returning GIs. We got a bigger problem. And I think we're gonna to have to get our workforce education system together to try and meet what those folks are gonna need. Otherwise, they're gonna be stuck. Okay, so what are you proposing? Are you proposing policies to entice people to go back to school? Or what, what do you see as the possible solution? So, you know, we've looked at a series of kind of what we call models. And there are some approaches in very innovative community colleges that are starting to do short programs. Um, there are some approaches that employers are trying in workforce education that can, you know, really offer interesting job opportunities in pretty short order. Uh, there's a set of, you know, there's some community colleges that are reaching not just community college students, but they're also expanding to reach high school students and teach them skills and to reach incumbent workers already in the workforce that need upgrading in their skills. So they're running kind of a trifecta, right? They're reaching three communities, not just one. Um, we're seeing short programs, right? Programs that can be, you take a technical program that could last a year or more and you try and squeeze it down. Maybe you can get it to, you know, 12 to 20 weeks right? If it's very intense, five days a week, right? Can we create short programs that folks who are, you know, older, already in the workforce can still take enough time off to be able to kind of upskill themselves to get into new jobs? It's a lot of movement on apprenticeships. And look, the IT sector has given us online education, which is a huge tool to begin to scale up the kind of education we need. It's not going to work for everybody, right? You know, you're not going to take a, you know, 55 year old steel worker uh, and put him in front of a blue screen in their basement to learn a new skill set. That's just not going to work for them. They need to work in communities. And all of us, education is social. So, can we build a mix of online and face to face that works to people, gives them communities and cohorts to work with, creates that kind of a social experience for them because we're social animals, but at the same time takes advantage of the IT online stuff to really scale up. So can we build this blended model of education and bring that to workforce education too? Well, it seems like a huge challenge because of course we are, you are championing for education, but 
our competitors, Jana included, they have really, those kids are rigorous study. They start, my friend teach Chinese students that at age five, they already speak and, in, uh, uh, and write English. <laughs> she teach them via the internet. And this, this kids is the new competition, or it's not the new, I mean, it's the competitors we've been having for, uh, for uh, one or two or even three decades already. And with the uh, globalization, uh, the labor force is so cheap abroad, even south as Mexico, you, you can get a worker for almost half of the price as the United States. So uh, I, see, I, I see a huge challenge for the workforce, um, the manufacturer workforce in the United States, in spite of uh, having improving their education. Yeah, look, it, it's a big challenge, right? There's no question about it. But let's take a look at Germany, right? Mm. Germany pays 60% more in manufacturing wages to their manufacturing workers than we pay to our manufacturing workers, right? And Germany is running a trade surplus that is the largest trade service in, surplus in manufactured goods that we, the world has ever seen. And it is running a major trade surplus with Asian nations. So that's a high end, high cost, high wage, advanced economy that has figured out how to compete on manufacturing. Right. You know, we're assuming that we have to lose manufacturing jobs because we pay high wages in manufacturing often, right? It's not true. Germany shows us we don't have to lose high paying jobs. And 20% of the German economy is manufacturing. Only 8% of our economy is manufacturing now. It's wow. declined so much. So what are they doing? What are some of their lessons? Could we learn from them? And one of their key lessons, one of their absolutely key lessons is workforce. They have a workforce training system to die for. And when they want technical advances, they throw the idea onto the factory floor and there's a swarm on that factory floor of folks that have gone through apprenticeship systems and gotten very good backgrounds in manufacturing and they all tackle the problem together. It's much harder to do that on our factory floors. So we've got great talented people in this country. We've got hardworking people in this country. If we give these people the skills, we can compete. Wow, okay, and how much, giving these people the skills, how much is government initiative and how much is the own personal in initiative of each person because right now there even mit has almost a whole curriculum of classes for free on the internet but how many people are taking advantage of that opportunity no, not that many surprised, Elaine. oh really surprised. look let me just describe it to you because i work for mit's open learning wing right? right that does all the online education for mit and we're starting to really move into workforce education ourselves right? Which is why we did this big study. So MIT as a campus, we've got 11,000 students, right? MIT has developed something called MicroMasters. They're like one year certificate programs, right? We've got one in advanced manufacturing. We've got, uh, we've got one in supply chain management. These are, these are workforce oriented programs by and large. We now have over 600,000 students enrolled wow. in these micro master certificate programs alone, right? That gives you some idea. Where's MIT? Is it the 11,000 kids on campus, right? Or is it this much bigger thing that we're in the process of creating, right? With often highly practical skills available. So, and we're gonna be doing more of that and we're gonna be doing more technical education as well through a variety of kind of means. So. Online is going to be part of this story. It's not the only part of the story because blended learning is better, all right? And blended learning is needed, particularly for older and less skilled workers. But it can be part of the story. And that's, that's one of the cards that we've got to play in this big effort to upskill because the IT technologies have come into many sectors, manufacturing, but also many services sectors. And folks are going to have to get those skill sets. Online is a way we can kind of scale up that education experience building on what we've got already, which is, you know, an interesting system of community colleges. And there's some very strong ones among them that we can build these pieces around. Well, you are right. I'm surprised. I, I mean, uh, it's just that 
we just get to hear the bad news over the uh, over the, the media and and this is wonderful news but no one is writing headlines only i have to invite you to my podcast to let us know that this is this is the current trend that nobody else is talking about yeah look i mean we got a long way to go right i mean in our country there's school on one side and there's work on the other side, right? And we don't have the links between the two, right? Many European countries, some other parts of the world, there's a really good pathway between school, you know, high school and very good jobs, right? With education that's built into those connections, right? Apprenticeship systems, better workforce training system. If you ask an American, you know, what high school looks like, you know, we know. What does college look like? We know. You ask an American what the workforce education system looks like, you're going to get a blank stare, right? We don't really have that. We haven't really, we've got a lot of pieces, but we haven't put that system into place. That's what we now need to do, right? We need to make those connections between school and work profound, and then we need to build on top of that a whole lifelong learning system. Wow. Uh, another issue that comes often, and we, hear, we don't stop hearing about this, is the issue of income inequality. Uh, the average Joe Blow, I don't know, earns 40, 50, 60,000 US. And then when we compare ourselves with the likes of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Warren Buffett, we feel disgusted actually by so much inequality there is and and even you don't have to be Jeff Bezos you go to Silicon Valley and everyone is a millionaire compared to the rest of the the United States let's say but isn't eco income inequality something that has always existed. I mean, if we look back, we see uh, John D. Rockefeller, JP Morgan, Andrew Carnegie 100 years ago. It was almost the same disparity as it is today. Yeah, look, income inequality has been with us forever and it will be with us for a long time. But the issue for me is how can we make that middle class healthier? Right. How can we, instead of thinning out that middle class bar in the barbell that David Otter writes about, how can we? How can we make that deeper and richer? Mm -hmm. How can we create that middle-class experience for many more than we are now? Right. I think that's what the key here is. And you know, if, if we can make that middle-class stronger, lots of things in America get a lot better fast, right? And look, the test for me to rich people, about rich people is, you wanna get rich, fine. Just create jobs for people, mm -hmm. right? Just create jobs. And you know, let's hand it to Elon Musk tens of thousands of jobs that come out of his adventures, you know, more power to him, right? Go out and create more car companies, uh, you know, get us to Mars, right? It creates a lot of jobs. So let those people do their thing, but let's us work at really trying to build this middle class. So we can take advantage of those new higher skilled job opportunities that are going to be out there. Because at the moment we're leaving jobs by the wayside, right? In manufacturing alone, just from retirements, because it's an aging workforce, there are going to be over 2 million manufacturing jobs just opening up from retirements over the next 10 years, right? There are real opportunities there. And these are not rote jobs in dirty, dangerous places like they used to be, right? Modern manufacturing factory looks more like a clean room. And these are very technology, skill, IT-oriented positions. They require a whole upgrade in skills, but there will be very real income and job opportunities in them, even in a sector which is which for a long time went down. Now it's now stabilized now for some years. The question is, can we make it better, right? By bringing these new technologies on, but we've got to have the workforce to get there. Right. Okay, so I, I can see some benefit of policymakers and entrepreneurs reading your book and getting inspired to create and educate this workforce. But what can a regular individual like me or like, one of my listeners do in order to help promote this workforce education in America? Well, I mean, read the book for us, of course, right? Um, but, and there's a lot of ideas and we really try to set out, you know, some models that can work. And I, I, there's opportunities in every space, right? There's opportunities for employers to move into better workforce upskilling and, and, we find that they're gonna to need to connect better to community colleges and help community colleges design the kind of programs 
that train for the skills that the companies are going to need. So if you're at a company or a firm, that's an opportunity space. You know, bring together not just your company, right? Because that's not a very efficient model, right? Bring together other companies, create groups of companies that share similar needs for upskilling their workforces, and then engage with your area community colleges to get the programs that you need to kind of build those skills that the employer group has kind of worked out. I mean, that would be a great model, right? And employees and, and, and folks and companies could really, they could run that. And we've seen that happen many times. You know, if you're in education, you know, there's a real opportunity to build that community college and make its model and make it stronger and bring in kind of new programs. There's opportunities for people to get involved in creating apprenticeship programs, right? So the opportunities are legion here, and there's many ways to engage. Uh, and, you know, this book tries to spell out a, a bunch of them because they're, they're new pathways of opportunity. William, you heal me, you fill me with hope. Now, before speaking to you, I saw everything as doom and gloom, and now I feel motivated to help somehow. So can you please give us one more time the title of the book and where can people follow you? Sure, it's called Workforce Education, A New Roadmap, and it's available through MIT Press. So if you just go to MIT Press and plug in Workforce Education, there's a whole bunch of information about the book that you can call up. William, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks, Elaine, really appreciate it.